So last couple of days, we talked about energy. Okay? We talked about the different kinds of energy. We talked about the laws of thermodynamics. Okay? Um, and we are going to come back to that time and time again in this unit. Okay? We're going to look at you know, how work and energy go together. We talked a little bit about the work energy theorem. Okay? Things like that, how work's a change in energy and all that kind of stuff. But now we need to look at kind of the stuff that is even more basic than that. Okay, before we can get to the kind of the in-depth math stuff that has to do with work and energy, we've got to talk about simpler things, right? And what we're going to look at today is the two types of measured quantities that we might deal with in Science 10 physics, okay, or in physics in general, right? Uh, those two things are called scalars and vectors, right? Now, it's important to understand that we as North Americans do not communicate distance correctly, okay? I'll give you an example. Carly, how far is it to Edmonton? How many of you are thinking about the same thing? Okay, what did I ask Carly? I asked her how far, what did she tell me? She told me how long it takes to get there. That's how we think, okay? That's how we think as North Americans. When someone asks how far is it, we tell them how long it takes to get there. That's not what they asked, but it's what they want to hear. Yeah, it's what they want to hear, right? But here's the problem. It's not always four hours, okay? Sometimes, sometimes it's more than that. Sometimes it's less, okay? If you're driving with me, it's probably less, okay? Um, but if it's, if it's really snowy out, okay? Like, like when we go in Physics 20, we go up to West Edmonton Mall and we, we do an amusement park physics uh, kind of field trip, okay? Well, yeah, you should take Physics 20 and we do that, okay? Okay. Um, but when we go up there, sometimes we get up there in like three and a half hours, okay? And we have had times where we got back here, leaving West Edmonton Mall at 4 o'clock, got back here at 2.30 a.m., okay? Yeah, snowstorm, accident, road closed, had to take a whole bunch of detours, go 30 kilometers an hour or less, okay, all the way back, right? That's why we don't want to communicate when someone says, how far is it to Edmonton? We don't want to say four hours. It isn't always four hours. Sometimes it's more. Sometimes it's less. That's not a consistent means of measurement. Okay? But that's how we as North Americans feel because of the way we get around. We get around by getting in a car and following a road from one place to another. And usually roads have speed limits, and so the time it takes to get from one place to another is reasonably consistent. It's not 100% consistent, but it's reasonably consistent. Okay? Um, if you go to Europe and you ask people how, how far is it from one place to another, they give you the distance in kilometers. Okay? They don't, they don't uh, because most people there do not travel by car. Okay? Rail and, and things like that are far more common in Europe than they are here. Okay, and so they don't tell you how long it how long it takes. They tell you how many kilometers it is. Right? Everybody, follow me on that one. Okay, now I'll give you another example. This is one where I got totally totally screwed on on somebody telling me a distance by telling me time. Okay, a friend and I were backpacking in Kootenay National Park, and we had an especially long day. It was a 38 kilometer day, and it was over two very big mountain passes. And it was, we had left our first campsite at about 6.30 in the morning because we knew it was going to be a long day. And it was about 4.30 in the afternoon and we were just beat. And we weren't where we were supposed to be yet. And we were kind of starting to feel like we really should be there. And we're starting to get a little concerned that maybe we'd gotten ourselves lost. Um, and then we're kind of sitting down in this pass and just kind of thinking things over. And this guy comes bebopping along the trail and he's in like, fatigues and he's got this pack that must have weighed more than me, but he is practically sprinting, right? But now, this didn't really occur to us until after, okay? The guy was probably like a Navy SEAL out for a jog and he was going to do the whole trail, which would take us four days and, and a couple of hours, right? Anyway, he comes bebopping along and we're like, hey, it's good to see somebody. Like, uh, you know, we're trying to get to uh, Tumbling Creek Campground. Um, you know, you came from that direction, we assume, like how long, how far is it? And he says, oh, it's nothing. It's like 20 minutes that way. For him, going uphill, we were going downhill. He said, 20 minutes that way. Because he's, he's a Navy SEAL and he does things like this for fun. You know, like just as a little bit of exercise probably, right? So we're like, oh, sweet. We're almost there. Throw our packs on. Let's go. Well, 
55 minutes later, we stumble into the campground, so tired we can barely stand, and we are cursing this guy. Okay? Like, how could that guy tell us it was 20 minutes? Like, that is so stupid. You know? And uh, then, then we sat down, we had a drink of water, had something to eat, and you know, the blood sugar comes back, you start thinking straight again. And we're like, did you notice what that guy was wearing? Like, he, had, he had, like, Canadian Forces gear on. Yeah. It probably did only take him 20 minutes uphill. Yeah, he was really moving when he talked to us. Right? You can't tell somebody it's 20 minutes when your speeds are not the same. Okay? His speed was obviously far superior to ours. Okay? He was probably fresh and in way better shape than us. Okay? Like, you know, I'm a reasonably tall person. I hike at a reasonable rate of speed, but my best friend who was hiking with me is about five foot four, okay? and he's a square. Okay, he's he's a wrestler, okay, or he was back in the day, a university wrestler. So he's not exactly built for speed. He's built for power. So we didn't go very fast. And uh, that's, by the way, that's the key to hiking. Always, if you're worried about bears, always hike with somebody slower than you. Okay. <laughs> They, and I, he knows that. I told him that. I said, hey, I'm going hiking with you because I always want to hike with somebody slower than me. He goes, hey, I'm closer to your knees than you are. <laughs> We're good buddies. So we, we have you know, that kind of back and forth. Obviously, we, we would never have left each other for dead with a, with a bear, but um, that's just kind of a joke there. Okay, so the important thing to realize here is we as North Americans do not communicate that kind of stuff correctly. We don't think in a proper physics line of thinking in terms of our measurements. So we are going to have to make a change in our thinking as we go through the physics unit. Okay? If a question says how far, it wants to know something in meters. Okay? Now, there's two different ways of communicating our measurements, scalar quantities and vector quantities. Scalar quantities only communicate a size. Okay, or a number with units. Okay, vector quantities communicate not just that magnitude, that size, but also direction. So if somebody asked me how far is it to Calgary from Okotoks, I would say, yeah, it's about like 35 kilometers to city center. If I tell them it's 35 kilometers, I haven't told them how long it takes. Okay, I've told them how far it is. But if they're not from North America, let's say, Let's say they came from Timbuktu, okay? They go, oh, okay, it's 35 kilometers from here. What if they have no idea of the geography? Was what I told them helpful? Well, I mean, a reasonably intelligent person would look at a road sign and go, oh, Calgary's that way. I'll go 35 kilometers and I'll be in Calgary, okay? Or they'll just walk outside and they can see it and they'll know which way to go, okay? Um, but if there's no way for them to do that, how many choices do they have for directions to go 35 kilometers? 360, right? If I face directly north, I've got one degree, two degrees, I go all the way around in a circle, I've got 360 choices for which direction to go 35 kilometers in. Now, we're reasonably close to Calgary, and Calgary's pretty big. Probably 40 of those 360 would probably result in me ending up in Calgary somewhere. Okay, but that's not really helpful. Okay, it's not really helpful because it's a scalar description. It doesn't mean it isn't accurate. It's 35 kilometers to Calgary. Okay, it's an accurate measurement, but it's just not as detailed as saying it's 35 kilometers north of here. Now I've given them a vector description. Here's where, here's how far it is to Calgary, and here's what direction to go as well. Okay, everybody follow me on that? Right now, had the guy that my friend and I ran into on the trail told us it's still six kilometers from here, okay, we would have said, oh, okay, and we would have done what? Well, we would have paced ourselves, but we would have also followed the trail, right? He didn't need to tell us it's northwest of here or it's 10 degrees north of, north of west from here or whatever, okay? He would have just assumed, like most people would, that you'd follow the trail or road. Okay, when I say it's 35 kilometers to Calgary, people get on the road, they follow the signs, and they end up there. A scalar description is still useful in a situation like this, where there's a path to follow. Okay, so don't get the idea that scalar descriptions are bad. Scalar quantities are useful, okay, in certain situations. And, in some cases, that's the only way to describe something. If someone says, what's your math? First off, you should never ask somebody that. Okay, it's rude. Okay, and secondly, no one ever tells you the right answer. Okay, if someone says what's your mass, you usually tell them. Well, actually, you tell them your mass. But if someone asks you what your weight is, you usually tell them your mass, which is not the right answer. We'll get to that later in the unit. Okay, 
Yeah, it's, your weight is actually a force. See, people do this to me. They say, how much do you weigh? And I tell them, I weigh 785 newtons. And they look at me and they go, uh-huh. <laughs> and they walk away, okay? <laughs> and they have no idea how much I weigh and they think I'm crazy. And that's fine, okay? They won't ask me how much I weigh again. That's an impolite question, okay? So um, they, they, yeah, it's weight and mass are two different things. Anyway, with mass, Mass is not something that you can give a vector description of. Someone, if you're telling someone your mass, you don't say 75 kilograms right or left. Right? That doesn't make any sense. Okay? Your mass is how much of you there is. That doesn't have a direction. That's just you. Okay? It's how much matter you contain. It's a scalar quantity all the time. Whereas your weight is a force, and that's a vector quantity. My weight is the force of gravity pulling me down. So when I say my weight, I also say 785 newtons down. Okay? And then they really think I'm crazy. In the, inevitably, I am. But I'm also right when I tell them that. Okay? Does everyone follow me on that? Okay? So some things are scalar. Some things are vector. Some things are kind of both. Okay? We, or we can describe them in kind of two different ways. Which one do you think time is? Is time scalar or vector? It's scalar, yeah, okay? The reason it's scalar is I've never known time to go any way other than forwards, all right? If, if I'm describing how long it took me to do something, I'm giving you the amount of time it took. That doesn't have a direction, okay? It's just how long it took me. It took me three hours to get to Edmonton, okay? It didn't, wasn't three hours west, okay? Now, we might say that, right? Oh, Edmonton's three hours north of here. That's not right. Okay? Time can't have a direction. I might travel for three hours in a northerly direction, okay? but time is not a, a vector quantity okay? because I can't make it go backwards unless you have a time machine at home and you know something I don't, okay? in which case we should talk. Okay? All right. Is that making sense, everybody? So there's scalars and vectors. Right. Okay, so any vector quantity has a direction. Like I said, weight is a vector quantity because it's a force, it's down. Okay, uh, if I'm talking about um, displacement, which is like distance, okay, except it gives me a direction. So it's how far and in what direction, whereas distance is just how far. Okay, it's a scalar quantity. And the same thing is true for speed and velocity. Probably up until today, you thought those were the same things. Okay? You would have used those two terms interchangeably, speed and velocity, or how fast you're going. To an extent, that's true. Speed is truly how fast are you going. But velocity is how fast are you going and what direction are you going. Okay? So if, I'm, if someone asks, what's your velocity, I would say 100 kilometers per hour north or west or whatever way I'm going. If someone asks, how fast are you going, I say 100 kilometers per hour. I don't have to give a direction, it's scalar. Okay, so we might just want to write here, okay? Scalar quantities that we're going to use often are going to be things like distance, speed, time, mass, and energy. none of those quantities will convey a direction. Okay? When you get a speeding ticket, not that you'll ever get one, but if you ever do, okay, it does not denote what way you're going. If it did, it would be a velocity ticket. Okay? It's the only time you'll get something that conveys direction is if you're going the wrong way on the road. Okay? That's a separate charge. Okay? It's not, 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 not part of the speeding ticket. Okay? Vector quantities that we're going to use often. Velocity, Displacement, okay, and acceleration. Okay, also force, but we don't use that except maybe once or twice in the whole unit, but it's a vector quantity as well. Okay, so quantities listed under vectors are always going to need a direction on them. 
in addition to whatever units they have and whatever magnitude they have. And by magnitude, I mean how big. Okay, so if I say 100 kilometers per hour, the magnitude is 100. Okay, the size, the measurement. Okay, so we're going to talk about now the if if distance and displacement both measure how far I go, I got to talk about how they're different then, because that's how they're the same. They both measure how far. Okay, but how are they different? Well, displacement's a vector quantity. Direction matters on that. Okay, the place where that comes into play. If I ran once all the way around the track outside there, I will have ran a distance of 400 meters. I will have run a displacement of zero meters. How is that possible? So the track is roughly an oval, but way, way more symmetrical than that. Okay. I start here at the start-finish line. I run one complete lap, and I come right back to here. I didn't go anywhere. I traveled 400 meters and ended up right back where I started. I have not displaced myself from my starting position. Therefore, my displacement is zero, even though I traveled 400 meters in doing that. Okay? So displacement, displacement is how far have you gone and in what direction from where you started. This just cares about how far did you go. It doesn't care where you started, where you ended up. Just how far did you go? Okay? How far did you travel? So it's possible for this to be an extraordinarily large number and this to be zero or a very small number. Okay? And it's the same with speed and velocity. Okay? If distance is really big, speed's going to be really big probably. Okay? But if displacement is zero, velocity is going to be zero. Okay, and that's because of this. We calculate speed by dividing distance by time. Right? Think about what the units for speed tip that you've associated with thus far in your life anyway. Probably kilometers per hour is the one you associate with speed. Well, kilometers measure distance and hours measure time, distance over time. Okay? That formula is different. The V and the D have little arrows over top of them. Okay? That tells us that they are now vector quantities. So this V is velocity. This D is displacement. Okay? So velocity is displacement divided by time. So if I have come back to where I started, I have not displaced myself. And as a result, I have no velocity because I haven't gone in any direction any measurable amount. Okay? Even though I took me an hour to do nothing, okay, or whatever, however long it would take me an hour to walk around the track, unless I was crawling. Okay, everybody, all right with that? Okay. So, the hiking example I already used with you, but okay, this is a different uh, backpacking trip that I went on uh, with my dad. It was over 200 kilometers in seven days. Um, so it's a long one. If I am here at seldom in campground, that's the first one, okay, and I want to get here to Snake Indian Falls campground, there's a sign right at the edge of seldom in campground that says Snake Indian Falls campground, 31 kilometers. Okay, what has it told me? It's given me a scalar description of how far it is from seldom in campground to Snake Indian Falls campground. It gave me the distance, right? What does that sign assume I'm going to do? Follow the trail, which is, you know, most of the time a safe assumption, okay? That would be the most logical way to get from this place to that place, right? Now, why wouldn't I just go in a straight line? Yeah, it's, this is a glacier here, this gray stuff. It's kind of hard to travel over, right? And there's, there's rivers and all other manner of disaster along that line, okay? If I had a helicopter, that's the way I would go. Okay? I would travel in a straight line then if I had a helicopter, but that kind of defeats the purpose of backpacking. Okay? So we would go from one place to the other in a straight line. But the sign outside of the campground does not say that Snake Indian Falls Campground is, um, let's estimate here, 18 kilometers uh, at, let's say, 
20 degrees north of west. Okay? It doesn't say that, because that's not the way you'd want to go. Okay? It would be virtually impossible to travel along that line by foot. Okay? But if you were in, in a helicopter, you could take out a compass and go, okay, I'm facing north, I'm going to go this many degrees west of north, and I'm going to follow that line, that heading for 18 kilometers, and I'll be right there. Okay? If you're becoming a pilot, that's something that you have to do. Okay? Is be able to plot a straight line course from one airport to the other. Okay? And in some cases, you have to take into account other factors like wind. How much is the wind going to push you off course? How much do you have to head into the wind in order to maintain that course? So there's a lot of vector stuff that goes into becoming a pilot, getting your pilot's license. Okay? You have to be able to do vector stuff okay, in order to do calculations on a map. Okay? Making sense? All right. So obviously then... Um, the sign does not say it is seven hours from this campground to the other, right? Because some people don't get to this campground in one day, okay? Some people have to stop, okay? Especially if it's really muddy, like it was the day my dad and I did it. We were in mud up halfway up our, our leg, okay? Well, each time you have to pull your leg out of the mud, you go kind of slow, okay? So it took us a lot longer than maybe it would have taken us if it wasn't all muddy. Okay, so the point is, don't tell people how long it takes if they ask you how far it was, even if that's really what they wanted to know. Okay? You should point out to everybody that that's not what they asked. Okay, so if I say that Calgary's 40 kilometers away, there's nothing wrong with that description. It's accurate, but it's a scalar description. Okay? It does not tell people which way to go. It makes the assumption they're going to follow Deerfoot or McLeod or whatever okay, and get to Calgary. Okay, it's going to make that assumption. Okay, but that, again, does not mean that it is not accurate. It is very accurate. Maybe I, maybe I measured it with like a, you know, a measuring tape, and I measured it to the nearest millimeter. Okay? That would mean it's an incredibly accurate number. It just doesn't have as much information description-wise as a vector description of that would be. Okay? So if I gave a vector description, okay, I would say Calgary's 40 kilometers away on a vector of 13 degrees east of north. All right, same accuracy, but I also provided additional information. I said what direction to go. Okay, that makes sense to everybody. All right. Okay, so when we give the distance an object travels, we use a scalar quantity. Okay, when we give the displacement, we're giving kind of a heading as well. Now, I lost what was on this page here. Lost my drawing. Okay, so my drawing is going to look like this. Uh, That's the Sheep River. That's my house. It's not really where I live, but okay. I'm not going to tell you guys where I live. Um, so I'm going to go from my house to Walmart. If I'm on the other side of the river, so I'm on this side of the river from Walmart, can I travel in a straight line from my house to Walmart? Impossible. I cannot. I can't walk through walls and things like that, right? It's, I'm not going to be able to walk in a straight line. So I follow the road that comes up from my house, and I get to um, Southridge Drive or Northridge Drive on this side, okay? And I follow that. I take it across the bridge, right? And I go across the river, and that, that road kind of weaves around, goes by Dairy Queen, whatever else, okay? And then I get to the turnoff. I go into the turnoff, and then, you know, I do a little bit of stuff through the parking lot, and I get to Walmart, okay? Everybody with me there? All right. So let's say that in order to do all of this, that ends up being four kilometers worth of walking. Okay, four kilometers worth of walking in order to get to there. Is that a lot shorter? Yeah. Yes, it is. The red dotted line represents my displacement from my home. The black line represents the distance I had to travel in order to do that. All right, everybody okay with that? Okay, so let's just say, I can't remember what I made that distance to be. I figured it out one time. Uh, 2.8 kilometers, 38 degrees. All right, so this line here, okay, is 2.8 kilometers at 38 degrees. Um, we'll say that that's going to be south of east, okay? 
okay, as a direction. Everybody all right with that one? Uh, okay, good question. Why did I write south of east instead of southeast? Okay, difference, uh, reason for that is this 38 degrees is moving south from east. This angle then, which is also southeast, is not 38 degrees. Right? There's two 38 degrees southeasts. This one and this one, which does not go to Walmart. Okay, you follow me there? So this one here would be 38 degrees south of east, or it would be 52 degrees east of south. So it depends which one I measure from. Okay? I can't just say southeast now because that's not going to be accurate enough. There's, there's 90 degrees between south and east. Okay, you guys follow me there? 90 degrees between south and east. This isn't going to be a real big issue for you guys because we only deal with one dimensional motion in science 10. Okay, so you're not going to have to do compass directions or vector component addition using trigonometry until physics 20. Okay, so sorry, I gave you the really good part of physics 20, the west edge trip, then I tell you the, hey, trigonometry is a big deal. Okay? Trig is easy, trig is not, yeah. Okay. So obviously, guys, these two things, the distance and the displacement, are describing the same trip. But they don't look anything alike. Okay? But they are describing the same trip from different points of view, a scalar point of view and a vector point of view. Now, so that's going to give me, sorry, this is displacement, which is D with the arrow over top. Okay? This one is distance. How far did I have to go? Right? And very often you have to go further than it really is in a straight line. Right? You're always told this shortest route between two points is a straight line. Well, that's what displacement always tells you. The shortest straight line distance between start and finish. All right, I want to calculate my speed for this trip. Let's say it takes me a half an hour okay, to walk from my house to Walmart. All right? So I went four kilometers in 0.5 hours. In other words, distance divided by time. Okay, that's how we calculate speed, distance divided by time. All right, so 4 divided by 1 half is 8 kilometers per hour. Right? If I had kept walking, if I walked 4 kilometers in a half an hour, I would have walked 8 kilometers in an hour, agreed? Okay, so my speed is 8 kilometers per hour. If I want to calculate my velocity, velocity is displacement divided by time. So similar calculation, just different number. This time it's 2.8 kilometers at 38 degrees south of east, divided by one half. Okay, what's going to happen to all this stuff? Is anything going to happen to it when I divide 2.8 by 0.5? No, it's not. It's going to stay the same. Right? I mean, there's no way that I can travel 38 degrees south of east with a velocity in any other direction. Agreed? Right? Like, I can't go north and end up over here. That's not going to happen, right? The direction for displacement and velocity always have to be the same. I can't go one way by going another, okay? All right, so when I do that, I'm going to end up with a velocity of 5.6 kilometers per hour at 38 degrees south of east, okay? The direction just transfers over. There's nothing to cancel it or alter it, mathematically speaking, when I did that. Okay, because I divided by time, which is scalar. So I divided a vector quantity by a scalar quantity. I'm going to keep the direction in that case. All right, so I get to Walmart, right to the doors of Walmart, and just like I did last night when I went to go uh, get groceries, I forgot my wallet. So I have to turn around and go all the way back home because I'm, I'm, I was a ditz last night. If my head wasn't so cat securely fastened to my neck, I would have forgot it at home too. Okay. No, I drove. I cheated. Okay. Um, so I turn around and I walk all the way back home. It takes me exactly the same amount of time. So it takes me exactly a half an hour to walk back. No, I just said that. Okay. So now I've walked back home. How far have I gone? Eight kilometers. Okay. My distance traveled is eight kilometers. Well, what's my displacement? Zero. Yeah, my displacement from my starting position, which is home, is zero because I'm back at home. All right, my displacement is now zero kilometers. Okay, what's my velocity then? 
My speed's still eight kilometers per hour, because that's distance divided by time, eight over one. But now what's my velocity, which is my displacement divided by time? Zero, because my displacement was zero. Okay, if displacement is zero, velocity is gonna be zero, right? Because anything divided by zero is zero. All right, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, this is why the odometer in your car, the one that tells you how far you've driven your car, measures distance. Okay, if that measured a vector quantity like displacement, every time you came home, it would read what? No, it wouldn't read zero. It would read how far it is from the dealership to your house. That's a trick question. I'm just playing with you. Okay, right? If you, you didn't buy your car at home, right? It, had, it was zero when it was in the lot where you bought it. Then you drove it home. If you kept driving it around and around, kept coming home, it would always tell you how far it was from the dealership to your house. Okay? It would measure displacement, which would be great when it comes time to sell it. Because then you can tell people, hey, it's only got this many kilometers on it, like four and a half. Okay? Obviously, that wouldn't be true, and that's exactly why it doesn't measure it that way. Okay? It measures how far did you drive this thing. That way, if you drove it all the way around the world a whole bunch of times and came back, it would read an actual number and not four and a half kilometers. Okay? Everybody get me there. All right. So in some cases, scalar quantities are important. Okay? In other cases, they're not. Imagine what your speedometer would look like if it measured velocity. It wouldn't be a flat face. It would be a sphere. Okay? It would be a sphere with all the different numbers all around it, and then it would have to rotate in, in a three-dimensional space to always show which direction you were going. Okay? Like it would have to include whether you were going uphill to the northeast. It would, it would be all over the place. It would be really difficult to read. All right? that, that's, that's a weird one, but it's true. Okay. All right, so that's, this here, guys, is basically what we just talked about, what I just drew on there, the diagram of the trip to Walmart. Okay? So that's all of that there. All right, algebra, okay? Quick review of algebra. The last time you had to manipulate the equation for me, it was the mole equation, okay? It was the mole equation. That's the last thing you had to do. So now, sometimes we're gonna have to manipulate this equation for something other than V. Obviously, it's set up initially to solve for velocity or for speed, okay? If I want to solve for distance, how do I get distance by itself? Velocity times time, okay? So remember, we talked about the two and a half rules of algebra back in the chemistry unit, okay? The two and a half rules of algebra are, if you want to move a variable, do the opposite operation. Write these down in case you don't have them, okay? The two and a half rules of algebra, okay? To move a variable, do the opposite operation. So if I'm adding, I subtract. If I'm multiplying, I divide. Second rule. What you do to one side, do to the other. So if I divide one side by D, I have to divide the other side by D. Okay, we had to use both of those rules with the mole equation. We did not have to use the half rule for anything with the mole equation. And we won't have to use it for V equals D over T, but we will have to use it on the next formula we learn after that. Okay, the half rule is when moving variables Move what's not attached to your number first. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that in just a second. Okay, here's a formula you have by this at this point you have probably seen okay, in math 10. If you haven't seen that, okay, it's all right. I'm going to teach it to you later. It's, it's your graphing formula, yeah. Okay, it's the, the formula for a linear relationship on a graph. Okay, y equals m times x plus b. Okay, I'm not going to talk to you about what all that stuff means until we start talking about graphing. I'm just using it right now as an example of an equation and how to manipulate it. All right, if I want to solve for b, what should I do with m and x? Right now, I'm adding them to B. Agreed? Okay. And right now, they're not attached to B either, are they? Okay. So what should I do if I want to move them? I should do the opposite of what I'm doing right now. I'm adding them to B. Think order of operations. I'd multiply these two numbers together before I added them to B. Agreed? 
So really, m times x is just one number. I would subtract it, so y minus m times x. Okay, let's say I'm looking for m. Okay, I'm looking for m, and I need to move what's not attached to m first. What right now is not attached to m? B. Okay, how do I move b over to this side? I subtract it, okay? So now I have y minus b equals m times x. How do I get m by itself now? Divide by x. Now m's by itself. Okay, that's what that half rule means. When you're doing something and you have to move more than one thing, move what's not attached first. Okay. All right. Now that does that rule seem a little simpler now that you've seen one example of it? Okay. Okay. So looking at the manipulation of this formula, if I want to solve for d. Okay, Nick told me I need to multiply V times T, because really what I'm doing in that situation, okay, is moving T over to this side. All right, now, really what that means is that I am multiplying both sides by T. I've got a T on the top and a T on the bottom, so they cancel, and then I multiply this side by T. Okay, now I've got D by itself. Everybody all right with that? Okay. I want to get t by itself. I want to solve for t. I want to multiply by t. Yes, okay? I can't leave t where it is because it's on the bottom of an equation. And if I leave it there, I won't be solving for t. I'll end up with 1 over t, which is not the same thing. Okay? So yeah, I want to move t first. All right? So I'm going to do what I did before. And I want to move t over to here by multiplying both sides by it. Now, how do I get t by itself? Divide by v, right? Okay, so I bring v over here. And we've got t equals d over v. All right? Everybody okay with that? Okay? Algebra is not as hard as you might have been led to believe. Okay? Guys, I teach physics. Those are the only rules I use. Okay? That got me through university physics those two and a half rules, okay? You don't have to be great at math to do physics. In fact, many of my best physics students are actually, like me, not all that good at math, okay? I actually have sometimes people who are really good at math who struggle mightily with physics, okay? Because they can't get to the math. They don't see the stuff that happens in physics, so they don't know how to get to the stuff they're good at, which is manipulating equations and doing all that stuff. Okay? They can't even get there. Right? I have honestly had people with 90s in math who do poorly in physics just because they can't see it. Right? So don't think that, oh, I'm not really a strong math student. I can't be good at physics because it's not true. I'm not good at math, okay? and I'm good at physics, or at least I like to think I am. Okay? All right. So, I want you guys to write this example down. We're going to go through it here together. Okay, so this question wants to know the average velocity of the bus. Okay, now this, this trip consists of two parts. Okay, so what I have to keep in mind is that doesn't change how I calculate velocity. Velocity is still the displacement of the bus divided by time. It's just the displacement of the bus over the whole trip divided by the length of time the entire trip took. Everybody okay with that? Right? So you could have a problem that has like eight or nine different parts. Okay? Like let's say you were doing this for a trip from here at HTA all the way to West Edmonton Mall. You're going to have a whole bunch of sections to that trip, right? You're going to have the section here on, on uh, the, the kind of rural roads where you can go 80, and then you're going to have the part where you can go 100, and then 80, and then 110, and then back into the city where it'll be all over the place, and so on. You'll have a whole bunch of different sections. But in the end, you'll know how far it was from here to Edmonton and how long that trip took you in total, right? And in the end, that's what you want to find is the total displacement and the total time. That's what's going to tell you the average velocity. You don't want to find the velocity for each section, add them all together, and divide by the number of sections. Why don't I want to do that? Because that's how you've been taught to calculate averages up until now, right? Okay? It's, oh, it's, the, it's, it's everything added together and divided by the number of things. Except that 
they're not all equal parts of the whole. Right? If I treat the section of my trip that is from Calgary to Edmonton on Highway 2 equal with this section here from the school to the stop sign, that's not an accurate average, is it? Right? I was going 110 a lot more than I was going 65. Okay? But if I just add them together and divide by two, it seems like half the trip I was going 65 and half the trip I was going 110. And that's not true. Okay? So what I want is the total distance, or sorry, the total displacement and the total time. That's going to give me a more accurate average because it'll weight it the right way. Okay, so here's what I need to do for a question like this. I need to find the distance or the displacement of each part and the time of each part so I can add them all together. Okay, that'll give me the totals. So, sorry, when we're looking at this, we're going to write this as average velocity is total displacement over total time. That's, it's still the same formula, okay? It's still displacement over time, but this at least indicates there's a few sections to this trip that I'm taking into account. All right, so in part one, they tell me that the bus travels 100 kilometers north, and that takes 1.2 hours. All right, so I'm going to write that down as information for this. The 100 kilometers north, okay, and I'm writing that as a displacement because it gave me a direction as well, okay, and then the time, 1.2 hours. Okay, that's what I have for part one. Then it tells me that in part two, it, I went 62 kilometers south in 0.9 hours. What do I have to keep in mind here when I put those two displacements together? Right. I retraced my steps here. I went north and then I came back south. My displacement's going to be small because okay, I retraced my steps. Okay. So essentially what we have to do is we have to make one of these numbers in order to represent north and south mathematically. One of them needs to be and the other needs to be negative. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of how we represent directions. At least in science 10 when it's one dimensional, that's how we represent them, positive and negative. So right and left will have the same relationship, up and down, same thing. Okay. All right, so my total displacement then is that I went 100 kilometers north and then retraced my steps 30, or 62 kilometers, which gives me a total displacement of 38 kilometers north. Okay? Essentially, I subtracted 62 or I added negative 62 either way. Okay? What about my time? Do I need to make my time negative? No, nope, because if I do, it means I went back in time. Okay, <laughs> you laugh. It happens sometimes. I actually see people draw graphs that show objects going back in time when they're supposed to be just going backwards. Okay, and we'll talk about that when we get to graphing. Okay, um, and it, it looks at first like a logical thing to do. Like, oh yeah, well, backwards means that way, except that backwards was up and down, back in time was left and right. And it just, it happens sometimes. We'll just explain kind of how that is when we get there. All right, so the total time here, 1.2 hours and 0.9 hours. Okay, is going to be 2.1 hours. All right, now I have the two things that my formula says I needed, my total displacement and my total time. So now I'm simply going to divide those. 38 kilometers north divided by 2.1 hours. All right, so the average velocity of this bus is 18 kilometers per hour. Am I missing anything? The direction, right. This is velocity. It's a vector quantity. Okay, so it's 18 kilometers per hour north because I did end up north of where I start. Okay. How does rounding work? Well, Next time we're together, we're going to talk a little bit about something called significant digits, which is really easy, but that'll explain the rounding part. How many things do I keep? Okay, uh, we'll talk about that the next time. Right. 
oh, I, I follow what you're saying. Uh, in that case, I would still give them, it's still scalar because Highway 2 is not straight, right? You travel a bunch of different directions while you're on Highway 2. So if you said, follow Highway 2 to Edmonton this many kilometers, that's still a, a scalar quantity because they're going to go a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, v by itself is speed, scalar. V with the arrow is velocity, that's vector. Yeah. Okay, we'll call her a day there, guys.